Welcome to the Red Door Church Sermon Podcast. Red Door Church is a church seeking to transform the city of Pretoria by the power of the gospel. We are distinctly mission-minded, community-cultivating, and city-loving. Please enjoy this week's sermon, and don't forget to follow and continue the conversation by sharing with those around you. There we go. Really, there we go. Morning, family. I want to welcome you together with Pinky this morning. It's uh, no better place to be than together with family, together around the Word, and to praise God, and to be edified by God's Word. It's so good to be here this morning. It's good to even hear how the kids are singing downstairs, and they're having a good time, and praise God for that. Um, as Yonali prayed, my name is Reinhard, or Rankies, or Ray, whatever you feel comfortable with. I'm the pastor at Red Door Church, and it's lovely to spend time with you guys this morning. I love it that we're actually a small, intimate group. It's so good that we were just warmed by God's Word already in song this morning. I don't know about you, yeah, but I was feeling the songs this morning. It was pumping. The band had a band practice yesterday, and it was telling. It was a good time of the guys. <laughs> Is that a bad thing? I thought it was a, I was giving a compliment. Apparently not. <laughs> There's something in there that, I'm, that I'll repent of afterwards. I'm sorry. Um, if you're visiting us for the first time, we are currently in a series that we've titled Sent. We're going through the book of Acts, and we're kind of seeing how the church is established and developed and how it's moving forward and outward. And up until now, it's been a pretty rosy picture. Man, we've just seen miracles. We've seen the Spirit filling people. We've seen the establishment of the first church, and it's growing, and good things are happening. And today, as we've heard now, as Kwani read the text, is the first kind of bump, the first uh, blip on the radar as we encounter the culture of our modern day. And so it's good for us. It's good for us to see that even in God's word, as people were living our church, that it isn't just smooth roads and just rosy colored and everything is just happening and we're just loving on one another. No, we're actually coming into conflict with this world. And the title for today is quite interesting, The Intolerable Good News of Jesus Christ. And we're going to get to that in a moment. Um, One thing that reminded me of this morning's passage, and this is by way of introduction, is um, I read the story or looked at the story of a guy called Beckett Cook. Now, this is a guy that identified um, as living as a homosexual lifestyle. So he identified himself as a gay And then he came to faith, and uh, they didn't change his sexual orientation. Rather, what he decided to do was then follow Christ and live a celibate lifestyle. That's the way that he thought that it meant to be obedient to Christ in that moment. And it's quite interesting. As he decided to make this life change, kind of the pushback that he came from culture, not in him actually saying that other people are wrong, or not saying that this is what you should do, just merely by taking a stance And what he wanted to do, what was true to himself and following Jesus, he got a lot of pushback from culture. And so on the back end of that, he wrote an article for the Gospel Coalition in December of 2020. And I want to encourage you to go and read this article. We can post it afterwards. And he um, titles it, uh, Tolerating the Intolerable, or something like that. And uh, one of his titles is, Why Hollywood Praises Elliot Page and blacklists me. Maybe you haven't read or heard of Elliot Page. And I'm just going to read the beginning of this article to kind of bring us into his world. He says, or he writes, that the world applauded the actress Ellen Page when on December 1, she announced the decision to become a man, changing her name to Elliot Page. Meanwhile, my decision to no longer identify as a gay man because I follow Christ is unacceptable in our culture. Why the double standard? Eliot declares that he has finally become his authentic self. Why doesn't our culture celebrate my decision to be my authentic self? Is my authentic self less worthy of praise? Even Hillary Clinton uh, chimed in with a celebratory supportive tweet for Eliot saying, it's wonderful to witness people becoming who they are. Is it really wonderful to witness people becoming who they are? Or is it only wonderful when the true self they discover fits the popular cultural narrative of the day? If Clinton knew my story, would she tweet support for me becoming who I am? 
as a presidential candidate in 2008, Clinton opposed same-sex marriage. When she reversed course and proclaimed support for same-sex marriage in 2013, it seems she only did so because the political risk had disappeared. Friends, the, the, the interesting conundrum that, um, he, that Beckett is, is, is bringing before us is that the problem with letting current culture or current leaders dictate or set our moral standards is that they constantly change those standards. As Christians, we believe that the only place that we can really go to for ultimate truth or ultimate morality is to the God who never changes. However, when we take a stand or when we say that we simply believe in something else that popular culture believes in, it will put us at odds with the culture around us. And interestingly enough, a popular culture that tolerates everything won't tolerate you if you disagree with them. And it's exactly at this point when sparks begin to fly, when we're in opposition with pop culture. And when that's going to happen, we're all going to be faced with a decision at that time. At to what voice are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the popular narrative that's being spoken? Or are you going to listen to the voice of the one true God? Or are we going to be like Beckett Cook, captured by God's goodness, that he had no other choice but to be his authentic self in Christ? And that's exactly what the apostles in today's passage were facing. Um, they had this decision to make. But to fully understand kind of what their decision was and what the world was that they were living in, we need a little bit of historical context. And so uh, just to say that in 63 BC, before Christ, Jerusalem was captured or the nation of Israel was dominated by the Roman Empire. And at that stage, what the Romans did is they didn't have enough people to be set in every little town and every little city to kind of govern that town. And so they allowed the local government to continue to exist and exercise their rule of law. Rather, what they would then ask is that this local government would simply pay homage to the Roman rule. And so what this meant locally in Jerusalem is that Jews were still ruling and executing governance to some degree while paying taxes and adhering to Roman authority. And so the local Jewish governing body was linked closely to their religious institution. So not only did their priests and religious leaders give directions spiritually, they were also the local rule and acted like the local courts. And so if the local governing body, these priests, wanted to do something serious, like they wanted to execute someone or so they wanted to put someone to death, they, ha they had to ask permission of the Roman rule. That's why we see the Jewish leaders had to ask Pontius Pilate, a Roman official, permission to kill Jesus, because they didn't have the authority to do that. But in Jerusalem at this time, when you transgressed spiritually, you were also subjected to the local courts for, for punishment, which is interesting. Because even today, we've got a clear divide between church and state. So it's not our religious leaders running our law. But we also see similarly as to back then that what people perceive as morally correct today makes itself into the local rule of law. And oftentimes what that means is that modern laws and modern rules will bring, or will bring us into conflict with the governing bodies around us. And so we're discovering this more and more. We're discovering more and more what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Firstly, we learned at the beginning of Acts that to be a disciple of Christ means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It means to be a witness to the gospel of God. It means to be in a community. It means to be part of a local church. And today we're kind of seeing, we're seeing some characteristics of what it means to be in Christian ministry. And make no mistake, the book of Acts makes this crystal clear that once you become a Christian, you are in full-time Christian ministry. And so what we're going to discover today is to kind of see what Christian ministry looks like. And three things I want us to see today that is prominent in Christian ministry. There will be persecution, but there will be provision, and there will be a plan. This is going to be interesting. 
In today's passage specifically, we see that there is beef between a group of religious leaders that we call the Sadducees and Peter and John, the apostles. And this happened right after Peter and John performed a miracle. They healed a lame beggar. And after that, people came rushing to them and they gave this amazing speech and this amazing sermon on who and what Jesus Christ is. They were proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. Messiah means that he is the Savior, the one to come save us from our punishment that we deserve. And Jesus did this not just only through his death, but also through his resurrection. And this is what brought them at odds with those religious leaders. So let's read the text from verses 1 to 4. If you've got a Bible, you can unlock it or you can follow with us on the screen. It says, As they were speaking to the people, giving the sermon, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. And so we see in verse 2 that the Sadducees were greatly annoyed. I think this is a major understatement of the way or the attitude that the Sadducees had towards Peter and John. And so two big reasons we see immediately in the text why they were annoyed with Peter and John. Well, firstly, we see that the Sadducees actually didn't believe that the Messiah was yet to come. They believed that we were, they were already living in the Messianic age since the time of the Maccabees, so they weren't expecting another savior. They thought, no, this is what we have. Secondly, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Once you died, that was it. And so Jesus was the double whammy, the double wrong. He is the Messiah, and they preach that he was raised from the dead. And so obviously you can see why they had strong disagreement with the Sadducees. But we have to ask the question, is this it? Is that the only reason? Is that the reason why they were arrested? Not even left until the next day and then the rest. They were arrested, left in jail until the following morning to be heard. Why this overreaction when there are other religious leaders in their ranks like the Pharisees who disagree with them? Remember, the apostles weren't instigating an insurrection. They weren't planning an uprising to overthrow the Judean rule. In fact, even Peter noticed this and he said in verse 9, we are examined for a good deed being done. They were arrested for something good that they did. There has to be more at play. There has to be something behind the scenes why Peter and John were arrested. And I think it's twofold, and it's good for us to notice this. One, we need to realize what Christianity is. It is more than an ideology. It is more than a suggestive way of how to live. It is the proclamation of the kingdom of God, and that is a political statement. As such, it will bring you into conflict with other kingdoms. You will find that as you simply live your life as a Christian, that people will hate you for it. Either because they feel it's an attack on them, because you're not agreeing with their uh, uh, position, and so they already feel offended by that, or it is because we live as people of the light, and people don't like it when light shines on the darkness. People don't like it when they get exposed, when their hearts get exposed. Their conscience burns within them and their hearts and sin. But rather than running towards the light, people try to smother the light. They try to feel immediately better about themselves. It is the intolerance of tolerance. It is the double standards that society has when it suits their moral agenda. Family, what this means for us today is that not every person will like you. No matter how genuine and loving you are towards them, people will reject you. And people will downright just be mean to you. You are not to personalize this. This is not about you. But rather the kingdom you are part of and the king that you serve. I'm saying this this morning to warn you. 
and to encourage you not to get too down when this happens, to get too, uh, to personalize it too much on yourself. There's obviously a disclaimer with this as I'm saying this. I know we all know, and maybe we've been those Christians, to think if this gives us a license to be obnoxious. This gives us a license to be unkind, to be plain rude, because we look down on those that don't know what we do. We look down on those that don't hold the position that we do. And they're in making the same mistake of those that persecute us. No. Peter and John were arrested for doing something good. They were gentle and loving, preaching to people that came to listen to them. Being a Christian is extremely polarizing and it will lead to persecution precisely because it is a different kingdom ideology. However, it's not just that we are clashing with the people of this world, but also with the other kingdom of this world, the kingdom of darkness that belongs to Satan. Not only will we make people feel uncomfortable, but we are in direct opposition with the one who hates God and hates his people. Satan killed Jesus. He plainly went and killed Jesus, but didn't count on his resurrection. And now Satan can't do anything to God or to Christ, and so he's going after the next best thing, the thing Jesus cares about most, which is his bride, the church. He will try everything in his might to destroy, to corrupt, to physically or morally abuse the church. Persecution will come, and we'll see it in different forms throughout the book of Acts, but of this we can be certain. We will be persecuted as Christians. What it means for us today is not, not to be filled with fear, but we need to be on our guard. We need to recognize that means that we need one another, that we actually need to support one another in these times. It means that we need now more than ever the Spirit of God to comfort us, to fill us, to guide us. And this happens through the process of prayer. God uses prayer in a unique way to comfort the Christian. Prayer plays a pivotal role in the life and ministry of a Christian. It is the lifeblood through which we not only withstand persecution, but also enjoy a rich community with God. I'm not going to say too much about this right now, because actually at the end of this chapter, we're going to see it in action. And in following chapters, which is constantly going to return back to this theme, how God uses prayer to change people, to help us, to encourage the saints. And so church, if we want to be a church that withstands and thrives amidst persecution, we need to be a praying church, personally, individually, and definitely corporately. But in trying times, God still provides. He gives provision. Read with me verses 5 to 12. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem and with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all were of the high priestly family. But when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power, by what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed being done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by his name, this man is standing well before you today. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is what God provides, family. Peter is filled with the Spirit. Once again, giving an explanation, a defense, a sermon concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. God gives us his Holy Spirit. But note that Peter already had the Holy Spirit. He didn't get the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit left him and then he received it again. No, what we read is that at this particular moment, Peter was filled with the Spirit, meaning that the Spirit was actively working in him, actively guiding him, actively helping him to know what to say. This is something that we've spoken of before. 
We all have the Spirit, but we see the Spirit working once we go into the situations where the Spirit should work. It's when we take the leap of faith and trusting in God, when we enter into those difficult conversations and difficult moments when we see the Spirit actively working in us, actively convicting, actively helping and guiding and giving us the words. It happens as we are out on the job. As we take the leap of faith, just as you fall, think you will fall on your face, when you will not know what to say to that colleague or that friend or that family member, the Spirit of God steps in and fills us and controls us. And here are the words that the Spirit will give you and will remind you of in that moment. The words of the story of the life, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The punishment that, he des that we deserve took on himself. The righteousness that Jesus has that he gives to us. The words of the gospel. You're not going to receive any new revelation. No, the wow factor and what the Spirit is giving you is simply reminding you of what has already been done. The work of the Spirit in those moments is to warm our hearts with the magnificent truth of the gospel that we once again realize or in you can apply the gospel in a way that we haven't been able to do that before. To fully or to a more extent grasp what Jesus has done. As Peter shares these words, he says in verse 11, this Jesus whom you, and he's pointing to the religious leaders, rejected as the builders became the cornerstone. The builders, in this imagery or in this illustration, is referring to the religious leaders and teachers. They were supposed to build God's so-called spiritual house, his church, but they rejected Jesus the cornerstone. Now, buildings in those days had something that we call a cornerstone. It's literally a huge stone that was normally put in the corner of a house on which the whole structure rests. If you had a weak cornerstone or if you didn't have a cornerstone, ultimately the building will collapse. And so what is Peter trying to communicate through this illustration? Well, if you miss Jesus, you miss everything. The religious leaders were building in vain. What good is it that you try and live a morally good life, but you have no Jesus? The house will collapse. There is no salvation there. That's why he ends his speech in verse 12 saying, there is salvation and no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is what we should be communicating to people. These are the words that we should be sharing with people. We don't want people to drink less. We don't want people to swear less. We don't want people to live good lives and not know Jesus. When we share the gospel, we share a Savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're hearing this for the first time. You've heard many religious leaders talk and share what is good and morally upright. You've seen the standards being set there for you, which you must try and attain, but you've never heard about what Jesus can give and what Jesus did. Jesus came to save sinners, not good morally upright people. He gave his life so that broken people like myself can now taste life in him. Do not try and build your own spiritual house through good behaviors and then miss the cornerstone. God provides his spirit. God provides the gospel. God ultimately provides salvation through Jesus Christ. When tough times hit, we see that there will be persecution. We see that God provides, but all of this is also happening according to God's plan. Verse 13 now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they'd been with Jesus, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For a notable sign has been formed through them as evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order 
that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have heard and seen. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them, because the people were all praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. When they perceived that these were uneducated and common men, they were astonished. In Jewish culture, everyone goes through the same basic schooling system up until grade seven. And then either one or two things happen. One, you're going to show exceptional academic talent or promise, and you're going to progress to further learning institutions to be further brought up and schooled. Or, like the most of them, you would go into the family business. We see that the disciples and apostles did not make it in school, so they went into the family business. That's why they were fishermen. That's where Jesus found them. That's the people whom Jesus chose and called. And here's the reason for their astonishment. The apostles, Peter and John, were brought to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, that council, is made up of 71 of the highest-ranking officials in Jerusalem. All the spiritual leaders, the elders, the high priest, everyone would sit in a semicircle, and you would be brought in front of them to give an account of what is happening right now. Now imagine not having that schooling system background. All these guys have been trained. They're basically the professors of the day. Not being familiar with this setup, you don't every day go and sit in front of the whole Sanhedrin. It's pretty daunting. It would be like one of us, you know, it's easy to talk about what should happen during the pandemic. But if we were told this morning, hey, tonight you're appearing before Parliament to give your account of what the plan should be. <laughs> and you're going to be on national TV. It's going to be pretty scary. Yet Peter and John did not flinch. They spoke with boldness, spoke with boldness yet clarity. And this was inexplicable to the Sanhedrin. Yet they recognized that they were this Jesus. This was God's plan all along. Peter explains this phenomenon in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 26 to 31. Let me read for us. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. God uses not our strength, but our weakness to proclaim his name, so that people may see the strength and the power, the wisdom that does not lie within us, but rather in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you feel unworthy? Do you feel ill-equipped this morning, even frightened because you would not know what to say in a, situa in a situation like this or in a situation even with your friends or a situation where someone comes to you anxious and in despair and you feel fearful because you would not know what to say? This is exactly how God plans on using us when you're in that situation. This is where his power shines. This once again shows that Christianity is not for the sorted out, the seemingly important people of this world. It is for the humble, the meek, for those who are desperate and in need for a savior. God wants to use you where you are right now this morning, not where you could be, because of his spirit. Family, lastly, we see in verse 19 that Peter and John made it plain. 
There was a decision put in front of them. Either they're saying you are not allowed to teach anymore. Should they adhere even to the religious moral standard of their day or to whom are they going to give ear to? And they said they have no choice. Irrespective of what would happen to them, they were so convinced of the truth of Jesus that they had to obey God. They had to share. They could not do anything else but to speak about the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they were simply captured by God's goodness. Friends, this is the fundamental truth we need to come to grips with this morning. More than your obedience, God wants your heart. God wants your heart to be captured by his goodness and glory for you to see clearly how much Jesus really loves you, how much he really does want to use you, and that as we see his love, that we would be convinced that there is simply no other voice that we could dare to listen to. Not because we want to appease this God, but because we have a deep love for the one who loved us first. Family, times will get harder. Even when we good, do good, even when we want to share the truth of the beautiful gospel, we will suffer for it. However, let us not for a moment think that it would be somehow be more beneficial for us to give in for the voices of this age, to give ear to the moral standards around us. We've seen, even in the introduction, a matter of five to ten years, how those moral standards keep on changing, how the boundaries keep on shifting. There is no other truth. There is no other good news. It's always just giving sway to majority and popular demand of that day. No. We need to be captured by the one who was captured by death for our sakes. We need to fix our, gu our gaze on the sacrifice that has been made for our freedom. We need to live it. We need to share it. We need to speak the words of the gospel. Amen. Father God, we want to praise you and thank you. And one of our main reasons why we praise you is because we recognize this morning that it's not because of our goodness. It's not because of what we bring to the table, our own abilities or capabilities. In fact, Lord, even as we're listening to these words, even as we're reading this, even as we saw the boldness of Peter and John, we probably convicted this morning because we know of our own failings. We know how we have denied you, maybe even today, maybe even in this week. However, we want to praise you because we see that now more than ever, the love of the gospel shines through. We see that you want to come fetch us where we are, not because of our faithfulness or of our track record, because of the goodness of Christ. And so, Father God, I pray this morning that we would gather boldness, not because of who we are, but because of what you've done. May we fix the eyes on you. May we see the glorious sacrifice. May we, more than wanting to do the right thing, be captured by the right love. Father, may we be dominated by our affections for you, Jesus Christ. We praise you for faithful men and women in the past who have done this, who are giving up their lives for you, willingly, freely, joyfully. We thank you for the witness of the church. And Father, we pray that you might use us, yes, individually, but more than that, corporately as a church. Locally, yes, as Red Door, but all the churches in South Africa, because we do know the times of persecution has come and will come even more. We know that the divide between those who merely identify as Christians and those living as Christians will become even larger. And so, Father, what we need is a deep love and courage. Grant us this. May we be a church that not only has the Spirit, but is daily filled with the Spirit, daily controlled by the Spirit, stepping out into faith in those difficult situations. We thank you that you are concerned not only with our well-being, but with your glory. And because of that, this will be accomplished. And for that, we love you and we praise you. Amen.